Thank you for joining us tonight as we welcome back Dr. Rob Stanley to present on implant design, specifically what every dentist should know. My name is Adam, marketing specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. As I'm sure Dr. Rob will mention, this is part two of this webinar series. Part one aired in July of 2020. If you would like to watch part one, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we will send you the link of that recording. Before we get started tonight, a few housekeeping notes. If you do have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel and we will get an answer back to you as quickly as we can. And there is no CE credit offered for viewing or attending this presentation. Dr. Rob is an adjunct professor in the prosthodontics department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Dentistry and co-founder and senior instructor at Stanley Institute for Comprehensive Dentistry. Dr. Rob, we're all looking forward to your presentation. Thanks for joining us. Hello everyone, Dr. Robert Stanley here. Uh, today we're going to be discussing part two of a four part series being sponsored by Henry Schein. So thank you, Henry Schein. Thank you, Adam, for hosting us. Uh, the, the topic today was going to be on implant design, which uh, kind of is a topic that folks have a tendency to overlook. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna jump right into it and see if we can't make this seem maybe like it might be something that would be important to understand a little bit more as we go forward. So let's get started. So the first part, were of, of the series, we discussed the first key to implantology, which was location, location, location. So if an implant is placed in the right location, the likelihood of success is good and the likelihood of complications is low. And we said that the second most important thing is what we placed in that location. So the type of implant, what it's made out of and the design of the implant. So let's quickly review the first one real fast. And then we'll jump into today's topic, which is what? So I am the smile engineer, and that's because I have a couple of engineering degrees before I went to dental school. So I approach uh, the, the concepts of implant design and implementation a little bit different than, than your traditional approach. But I firmly believe that if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And so we talked about who this class was for in the last presentation. And that's for anyone, really. Anyone who's placing, restoring, or maintaining dental implants will get value out of this because it's a topic that needs to be understood by the entire community. And we started off by saying, what is a coordinate system? And as you recall, we have a very strong fondness for the Cartesian coordinate system. And we have our gang symbol that we use when we, when we, when we have fun with it. And we know what a, what a Cartesian coordinate system is. We use it all the time in dentistry. So this is when we're communicating with each other. We say things like move more mesial, move more distal, move more apical, more coronal. In endodontics, we take uh, working length radiographs. And in prosthodontics, we use depth cutting burrs. And uh, periodontists use clinical attachment loss. What we're saying with all of these, all of these things that we do in dentistry, what we're saying is we need to know a baseline, a starting point to know where we're going. Okay, so a coordinate system is very, very important. In fact, it's so important that we made it the center of our logo, right in the center. You see the triangle there, that is our coordinate system. So remember that we talked in the first video about functions. And we said that Y equals a function of X and then all of a sudden we lost half the audience because they're like, oh my God, I, I didn't think I'd ever have to see a function again. But remember how it works. So we use the example of the house temperature. We said, if your house temperature is a function of the thermostat setting, we all can understand what that means. That means that if we want it warmer in the house, we can turn the thermostatic setting temperature up and if we want it cooler, we can turn it down. So we know that the house temperature is a function of the thermostat setting. But we also know that the house temperature is not only a function of the setting of the thermostat, but also, say for instance, if we have any open doors. So if you have a house and you have a thermostat setting and you're say it's cold outside and you turn the thermostat setting up because you want it warmer inside, but the kids leave the front door open, it's not gonna get warm in the house, right? The, the, the door is going to impact the temperature of the house faster than your heater. So what we would say is in this particular case, 
the, the house temperature is a function of two variables, two variables, X and Y, the house the thermostat setting and the door opening. So why is this important? And it's important because when we talk about implant success as a function of what, we said there are a lot of variables. And this is where a lot of confusion can come into our practice and in our minds when we say, I don't know why this implant failed or I don't know why we're having complications. So I've taken the liberty to put down just a few of the success criteria that we all know exist, and here they are. And as you can see, there's a lot of them. So then what we did is we said, of all of these success criteria, one of these is probably more impactful than the other. So we asked the question, if you could only control one of the implant success variables, what would that one be? And in the first lecture, we said the first answer is location, location, location. And today, we're going to talk about implant design. And if I didn't have to go any further than this picture right here, we might be able to spend the entire time discussing it. And here's why. This implant was not placed in the right location. I hope all of us can agree to that. What we'd like to see is we'd like to see the implant underneath the prosthesis, right? So this implant's in the mouth, the implant's integrated, the crown is on there, and we have a solution. And this is going to always be a challenge for the patient. There's no way that this solution is not going to cause uh, a food trap for this patient, period. We can all agree to that. So there's, this is never going to be a 100% win, right? But the question becomes this. If we move off of the fact that the location is wrong, and we move on to the next, the next question, which is what, what type of implant was placed? Implant design. If we go to that question, imagine for a second that that metal that's being used there to support that crown was two types of metal. One, a really weak metal. Two, a very strong metal. Is it possible that if the metal that was chosen for this solution was a really strong, really strong metal that this might last forever? And the answer is, yeah, it could possibly last forever for the patient, okay? On the flip side, if it was a soft metal, is it possible, could you imagine that maybe in a couple of years that this might break? And the answer is, yeah, that makes common sense. And the answer is yes. And from a mechanical engineering perspective, that's exactly what we want to talk about today. So let's get into it. So we're going to talk about dental implant design at a high level. This isn't our full, this is not our full fledged version because it takes a little longer than a one hour presentation, but we're going to talk about some of the high level things and hopefully you guys will get some really good, some really good nuggets out of this. So the first thing I want to talk about is all implants work. If you are in dentistry, I'm sure you heard someone, a friend, a colleague, a lecturer, or someone say, all implants work. They all work. They're all the same. They all work. And we would have to say, why do we say that? Why, why do we say that? And this is a picture of why I believe the industry says all implants work. This picture right here is a series of, of very uh, unique solutions that were done 30 years ago. We have blade implants and press implants, all these different types of implants, and they lasted 30 years. Not only did they last 30 years on the patient, but she smoked a pack a day for 30 years. And we know that smoking obviously is a contraindication to the health of dental implants. So eventually they failed. So this is where we get the question, do all implants work? Well, yeah, because if you look at implants today, they don't look like these implants. So they don't look like this anymore. So why do they look different today? And the answer is success rate. So if those implants, those press implants, were at say a 96% success rate, but the new implants are at 99% success rate, the industry has a tendency to go towards the new ones that are designed in a way that increase success and decrease failures. Now, one of the things we need to note here is that you might be sitting back saying, mm, the difference between 96 and 99 is, you know, it's 3%, it's not a big deal. But let's reframe that. Let's say, Let's say that I'm having one failure in my practice every three weeks. 
and I'm at 99% success and you're at 96% success, you're having one failure every week. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty certain that you live just like I do, which is in a world where we want zero complications. We want zero failures. We don't want the hassles. None of us do, right? We want 100% success. That's what we're trying to, to accomplish. So the difference between 96 and 99 is 3X. It's a big deal. So let's talk a little bit about the implant design. So we'll start with this. This is an implant that failed because of the implant design. And in particular, the macrogeometry, the microgeometry, and the material. This is an implant. If you can see here, I'll draw an arrow for you here. So, right here is a fracture, and right here is a fracture. So hopefully you can see that the, the, the prosthesis is fractured on top of the implants. The implants have actually failed in this particular instance. And this is because of implant design. When we look at this one, this one has failed. If you can see right here, on the very top of that implant, that is a fracture at the time of placement. This is a failure due to implant design. Here is a case from Facebook. And it was funny because they put uh, the date that the implant was placed in 2017. And then they said, it looked like this last week with a little bit of crustal bone loss. And then it looked like this this week where it failed. This one failed because of implant design. This one failed because of implant design. This one failed because of implant design. So what am I talking about when I say implant design? What does that mean? Well, when we look at implants, there are eight main implant considerations that you would want to take into consideration. And these are the big high level ones. And as you can see from this illustration right here, the platform, the thread, the material, the flutes, which are those little cuts in the bottom portion of it, the apical considerations, the overall macro geometry called shape, the surface and the crest. Those are your eight main things. So if you were in the business of going and picking out a dental implant, you'd want to make a, a, a table, a, a, little, a, a little spreadsheet, and you'd want to say, okay, I want to go and ask the different implant manufacturers out there some questions about these main eight considerations. Today, we're going to cover just a few of them. And the first one I want to talk about is material. All right. And we've set this up nicely from that very first implant that was placed with kind of that gooseneck prosthodontic restoration. We're, we're going to start with material, and we're going to start with this slide right here. So most implants are made out of titanium, but did you know that titanium comes in different flavors, different grades? There are CP1 through CP4 grades, which are commercially pure versions of titanium. And what changes as we go from CP1 to CP4 is not only a little bit on the purity impurities that are in the metal, but the strength. So if you look at the strength ratio, as we go from left to right, you'll notice that it gets stronger. So the first one is 28%, then it goes to 40, and then 52. And then when we get to CP4, it's 64%. We had a 64% of this normalized value right here, this 100% right here that's on these two. So these two metals are titanium alloys. So they've had a couple of different elements added to them, as you can see here, that allows them to be stronger. So going back to our very first picture with the gooseneck, if you got the location wrong, but you're using a really strong metal, there's a possibility that even though it's gonna be a food trap for the patient, that it might last a long time. So then you have to ask your question, well, I'll only use, what if I only use the strong implant when I'm not in the right position? Well, when do you know that you're not gonna be in the right position? You always want to be in the right position, and sometimes it just doesn't happen. So sometimes it comes back from your surgeon or you place it, and it's not where you want it to be. So when it's not where you want it to be, a real good safety net is to have an implant that's made out of a very strong material. And as you can see here, all implants are not made out of the same material. They're made differently. So when you go to select an implant 
and you're at a trade show and there's a booth there and you walk up and you need to ask the person at the booth, what is your implant made out of? And if they say titanium, just smile and grin and say, thank you. I understand that part. But what grade of titanium? And if the, if the person behind the desk doesn't have an answer, they don't have an answer because they haven't been coached. And what I mean by that is if you have something in your product line that's valuable, you make sure that your sales team knows about it. If you have something that can be considered a flaw in your product, you don't tell your team about it. So if you walk up and say, what grade titanium do you have? And they go, I don't know. It's because they probably have a grade that's, that's the weaker grade. If they tell you, oh, thank you for asking, doctor, we use a titanium alloy, then you can be a certain that they are proud of that because they know that that material is stronger. There's another aspect to thread design that I want to talk about, and that is that bone reacts differently under different types of loads. We have a compressive load, which is when we squeeze something together, okay? When we squeeze something together, it's compressing it. And compressive loads are our are, are are, are favorite uh, loads in dentistry. So if you have a crown on, an, on, a, on a tooth and you push down on it, it's strong, right? How do we take a, a crown off? We pull up on it, which is called tension loads, right? So tension loads, we don't like tension loads. It puts our cements in weakness, but it's also the same for bone. So bone loves to be in compression. It's the force that it loves. It doesn't like to be in tension, okay? So if you were to hang from a pull-up bar and then someone was to strap weights to your ankle, we would call that torture, right? That's torture, that hurts, okay? But if you were to put a barbell on your back with a couple of plates of steel and in compression, you can do squats, that doesn't hurt. I mean, it, it hurts, right? Because you're doing squats. But the fact is, is that the body can handle compression much, much better than it can in tension. And what we really, really want to stay away from is shear, okay? So shear is very, very detrimental to bone. In fact, it's 65% weaker in shear. So those are, your, those are your science questions for the night, okay? Those are your science. Keep that in the back of your mind as we go through the next illustration because it's gonna make a big deal. We all know what a fish hook looks like, right? And we know that the fish hook goes in, but it doesn't wanna come out. And why does it wanna come out? It doesn't wanna come out because when we apply a force to the tip to pull it out, that little barb, the little barb that you can see right here, that barb is preventing the fish hook from coming out. That's why it's there, okay? So it, you don't lose your fish, all right? So what if we could use that concept to build an implant? So let's build an implant and we're gonna use that barb to help hold the bone in place. So I'm gonna take the barb off, I'm gonna slide it over, and then I'm gonna double, I'm gonna duplicate it, and then I'm gonna make multiple barbs and I'm gonna make my implant. And now when I push down on this implant with a force from the top, you will see that the bottom edges of the implant, these edges right here, are going to be pushing down on the bone, right? And it's on the same, oops, it's on both sides the same way, right here, here, and here. So when we push down with the force on the top here, this implant is going to be putting the bone in compression. That's where it's the strongest, right? So we say, okay, that looks great. I like that design. The bottom is flat, the top is, has got a curve to it, and it's gonna put the bone in compression. What if we turn the threads over? What if we reverse this? We get the implant you see on the right side. And when we apply a force to this, what you've created is kind of a nail, right? The one on the right isn't going to want to resist, it's going to want to slide right into the bone. It's going to want to go down into the bone because when you apply that force from the top, in this case, what happens is, is that the it creates a shear load on these interfaces here, you see? So these become a shear load. And what did we say about bone and shear? We said it's much, much weaker in shear. So the implant design on the right would be a, a, a less than optimal design because the, the, it's the same exact threads, it's just turned upside down. So what we call the one on the right, we call that a buttress thread. What we call the one on the left, we call that a reverse buttress thread. Now, buttress threads are on the right, that thread design 
is really, really popular at Home Depot. It's popular at Home Depot, especially near areas that have, have high winds, like here in the Carolinas, where we have hurricanes. And what we do with this threaded design is we use it for our decking. And what we do is we drive the screw through the decking down into the joist. And then when the winds come, they want to pull the decking up. And when they want to pull the decking up, what you get is you get this going on. So this is now pulling into the wood as, it, as it's pulled up and it keeps your deck down, okay? So it's great for up, uploading. So a load that pulls up on the screw, but we don't have loads in the mouth that pull up on the screw, do we? On our implants, we bite on them. So our forces are on the crown and they transfer down into the implant. So for our cases, for dental implant cases, we would want to just simply reverse that which is what you see on the left here. Now, I'm spending a little bit of time on this, and the reason I'm spending some time on that is because of this. The implant on the left has a flat bottom to the, to the thread, and then it has a, cur a slant on the top, which is exactly what you see on the, on the image on the left. So that implant would do really well with compressive forces. The implant that you see on the right the slope is on the bottom. The flat is on the top. So on the implant on the right, the slope part is on the bottom and the flat is on the top. It's, it's a butcher's thread. So it's going into the bone the wrong way for what we need it to go in for. It should be the other way around. Now you may be wondering, how is that even possible that we've got an implant on the market where the flat side is on the top? And I imagine, and this is my opinion, that this implant was made by a dentist and it wasn't made by an engineer because any engineer that looks at that would immediately say, wait a minute, the compressive forces are on the wrong side. We need the compressive forces on the bottom of the thread, not on the top. I, I wanna talk about threads, one more section on threads because I think that the threads turn out to be the area that are the least sexy. People don't talk about it as much and it has a significant impact on your overall success. The next thing I wanna talk about is something called the thread, the thread angles, okay? And there's two of them, there's theta and then there's alpha. Now theta we just talked about. So that was the angle of the bottom side of the thread. And we said, as we decrease that angle, things get better for us, okay? We wanna minimize that angle. So as you look over here on the left, I've given you an illustration, here is theta. So when theta is small, that's good. That's what we want when theta is small. But there's another angle. Look here, this alpha angle right here is defined by that right there. And what it is, is it's the angle of the pitch of the thread. So what it's saying is that the, the tighter the pitch, the less shear we're gonna be transferring to the bone. Okay, so let's look at how that might work out. So the theta angle is a function of the pitch. Now, this is why I want to bring this to your attention. There are implants that are coming out that are on the market and are coming out that have multiple head uh, threads. And if you look at the, th the, the implant on the right-hand side, notice that there's only one way to get from the top to the bottom. It's the red line. So if you were in a parking deck and it was a spiral parking deck and you're on the top floor, there's only one exit, the red exit. You have to get on the red exit to get to the bottom. You get on the red exit and you go all the way to the bottom. There's no other way to get off the top level. And the pitch is six degrees. So if you look at the picture here on the right, over here, that is six degrees, that's your pitch. Now, what if you're on the top of the parking deck and there's two ways to get to the bottom of the parking deck. There's a red exit and there's a blue exit. And in that case, you can see in the middle screw, we have a double thread, but the thread alpha angle is 12 degrees. We just doubled the alpha angle. Now, what that does is it doubles the shear load of the implant to the bone. Now, why would we do that? Well, the advantage to adding an extra thread is that the implant can be placed in the bone quicker. So 
routinely, I place a single threaded implant in the bone. It typically takes me about 15 to 21 seconds to place an implant. So if you were to go to a double thread, you could cut that in half. So let's say 11, 11 uh, seconds to place an implant. So we're saving about 10 seconds by going to a, a double thread. But the problem is we've just doubled our risk to shear load. And for heaven's sake, if you look to the last one over here, the third one, we triple, we go to a triple lead because obviously three is better than two. We triple the shear load. We're, we're increasing our risk to the patient's outcomes threefold. And for only for a few split seconds in terms of how fast we can place an implant. So my recommendation is stick with the single threads over here. They'll take just a few seconds longer to insert but they decrease the alpha angle, which decreases your shear load, which is a good thing. When we look at a radiograph, notice that it's easy to tell if you have a, on a radiograph, whether that implant has one thread lead or two. The implant on the right, notice that it has kind of a cross in the center, right in the center of the implant, the little threads look like you make a cross. That's because this is a dual thread implant. The one on the right doesn't have, the, I'm sorry, the one on the left does not have that. The one on the left is a single threaded implant. It only has one way to get from the top to the bottom. So we want to have the one uh, thread designs like the one on the left, not the one on the right. So we're going to change now from thread design and we're going to talk a little bit about crest. And crest is an area, it's the top portion of the implant. And it's an area that's received a lot of attention over the years. Most of you are probably well aware, this is the area where you can get some um, crestal bone loss, right? And so if we have crestal bone loss in aesthetic regions, that can sometimes become a problem. So there's a lot of, of, of uh, meetings and discussions and papers and uh, research that goes into how do we decrease crestal bone loss. But I have an idea that I wanna to present to you and I think it's pretty powerful. And let's start with something that comes out of 10 Kate's uh, Periodontics uh, book. And this is an essential fact that you need to understand. And I'm actually gonna read it because I want you to make sure that, that this really resonates with you the way it resonates with me. There's a unique feature of the oral mucosa is that the teeth perforate it. This anatomical feature has profound implications in the initiation of periodontal disease. The teeth are the only structures that perforate epithelium anywhere in the body. Nails and hair are epithelial appendages around which epithelium continuity is always maintained. This perforation by teeth means that the sealing junction must be established between the gums and the tooth. If we go to uh, the book, Human Oral Mucosa Development and Structure and Function, it says this, the region where the oral mucosa meets the surface of the tooth is a unique junction that is, that is of considerable importance as it represents a potential weakness in an otherwise continuous epithelial lining. So these two different books are bringing to light the fact that the tooth is the only spot in the body where something penetrates the epithelium. Now, when we take the tooth out and we replace it with a dental implant, the dental implant now takes on that responsibility. But what's different? The dental implant's inert. It's a piece of metal. The tooth is vital and it has the ability to do things that are different than the, than the implant. The hypothesis that I propose here is that our crustal bone loss that we've been talking about the reasons for and why and how we can minimize it with platform switching and, um, and uh, um, uh, the type of crustal features that are on the implants all come down to the following hypothesis. All crustal bone loss is associated with connective tissue to implant seal. Think about this just for a second. If you have an implant in, and you have immediate connective tissue attachment to your implant, just say theoretically you could have that occur, how much bone loss do you think you would have around that implant? And you probably all would agree with me, if that was possible, if you could do that, if it was possible, you probably have very, very little crustal bone loss. I believe that we have not given enough emphasis 
to the fact that we have something punching through the skin. We have a, a foreign body that is going from inside the body to the outside the body, and the body doesn't like it. The body doesn't like it one bit, and it wants to seal it off, or it wants to reject that implant. Okay? So what's the take home? The take home here is that we better have a really, really good contact. We have, we have to maximize our contact between our implant and our connective tissue so that we don't initiate a foreign body reaction where the body says, I want to reject this implant, i.e. I want to spit this implant out. So there is a product called laser lock and laser lock is a series of channels that have been machined through a laser at a very, very specific depth and frequency onto the neck of BioHorizons implants. They have the patent on this. And this response allows an actual connective tissue attachment to the metal, okay? And they're the only ones that have been proven to have this. The, the, this attachment helps prevent the epithelial cells from migrating down around the implant. And we can imagine that if the epithelial cells do migrate down around the implant, that that might not be healthy for the underlying bone and the underlying bone will recede, retracting away from the threat, okay? So that would be a bad thing. And the other interesting thing about laser lock is that the osteoblast and fibroblast both have an affinity towards the laser lock geometry, which means that this surface technology, the surface technology that's on the top of these implants is dual affinity. It likes connective tissue and it likes bone equally as well. Why is that important? That's really, really important because when we place an implant in the mouth, almost never do we place it at the level of the bone because there's never level bone. If you look at the bone in the mouth, it's almost never level unless we're doing a bone leveling process like when we do a full mouth case, okay? Otherwise, the mesial, uh, the mesial interproximal bone goes up, the distal bone goes up, the palatal bone goes down, the facial bone goes down. So you have what's called a saddle point. You don't have a level point, you have a saddle point. What does that mean? That means that when we place an implant into the mouth, parts of the implant are going to be subcrestal and parts are going to be supracrestal in most cases. And when that happens, you need an implant that's capable of attaching both to bone and to soft tissue. And that's where laser lock comes into play. In fact, here's a great paper that was, that was published that shows on the left are traditional Sharpie fibers in cementum, and on the right, functionally oriented collagen fibers attached to laser lock. This is an amazing photo. It's, it just really, really illustrates how good laser lock is at creating a seal around the neck of our implants. If we get that seal, we can maintain bone. And one of my favorite papers that's ever been published in any of the uh, implant literature is this one right here. And why? Because I'm a scientist. And scientists like to change one variable at a time. And we change one variable at a time and we look at for what that one variable by itself does to the outcome. And here we have a great case of 300 implants. And what they did is they had exactly the same implants, except for one thing. One of them had laser lock and one of them had just a standard rough surface. That's it. Everything else about it was the same. And that's why I really, really love this because sometimes people will say, I think laser lock is a marketing ploy. And I'll say, how can you say that when you see a paper like this? So what they're showing here on the top lines there, you can see that the top lines with laser lock, that they lost about four tenths of a millimeter. About, well, they, they're reporting about 0.58 millimeters of loss on average with laser lock. The exact same implant without laser lock, they lose a millimeter. They double the loss of crestal bone around the neck of the implant. And this is on their product. So it's pretty, pretty powerful when you see how effective it is. And remember, it's dual affinity. These are great photos. So the one on the left is laser lock with fibroblast attachment. The one on the right is laser lock with obviously bone attached to it. So here is a quick video to describe exactly how laser lock works.
BioHorizon's revolutionary laser lock technology is a series of microscopic channels engineered onto the surface of BioHorizon's implants and abutments using a pulsed excimer laser. These unique microchannels are optimally sized to control and organize fibroblasts, epithelial, and osteogenic cells. During the healing process, epithelial cells are guided into the precisely dimensioned microchannels and firmly attached pseudopodia to the complex nanostructure of the uniform laser lock surface. The guided cellular response generated by the laser lock technology continues with subsequent layers of epithelial cells, creating organized junctional epithelium successfully integrated onto the implant surface. As a result, epithelial downgrowth is inhibited. While the junctional epithelium is being created, fibroblasts migrate to the laser lock surface apical to the epithelium, attach and secrete collagen fibrils that lock onto the laser lock structure. This connection forms a robust soft tissue seal that has been shown to reduce sulcular probing depth. The attachment establishes a protective soft tissue layer around the implant that protects the crustal bone from bacteria and trauma. Once a stable soft tissue seal is created, osteogenic cells migrate along the implant surface and are directed into the laser lock microchannels where they attach and differentiate. Osteoblasts begin to form a circumferentially oriented bone microstructure with trabecular attachments parallel to the microgrooves. These structures mineralize during normal healing. Bone formation around the laser lock surface has been shown to result in greater bone to implant contact faster osseointegration and higher crestal bone levels than other implant surfaces. The inhibition of epithelial downgrowth, establishment of a soft tissue seal, and greater bone to implant contact created by the laser lock microchannels maintains function and aesthetics long term. Moving from Crestal to the internal portion of the implant design, we're going to start to talk about something called Spiral Lock. And we started the whole presentation off by saying the most important thing is location. And if we don't get the location right, then having a really good implant can help in, in many ways. Spiral Lock is going to be another way that can really help us. And what Spiral Lock is, is this technology that was designed by the Stanley Fastener Corporation, unfortunately, no relationship. And they designed it for NASA. And they designed it for the sole purpose of preventing screws from loosening, because NASA launches big things into space with lots of temperature changes and lots of vibration. So they created Spiral Lock, and here's how it works. Spiral Lock helps to take the normal distribution of a thread and distribute it over more threads equally, and to have that force go out radially more than, than um, uh, uh, proximal to the threads. So let me show you how it looks here on this illustration. So notice on the thread on, on the, the picture on the left here that the first mushroom right here, this first mushroom right there, that looks terrible. Let's do this. This first mushroom is much bigger than the fifth mushroom, right? And they get smaller as they go. So that's the first thing you want to note. Look on the one on the right with a spiral lock. This mushroom and this mushroom are almost the same size, the colored mushrooms. They're almost the same size. So what does that mean? Well, let's pretend like we have a tug of war going on and each side has five people on it. And on the tug of war on the one on the left, the first person is pulling 100% and the last person is checking their email. Okay, what's gonna happen? Well. The person on the front might burn out and lose strength early, right? And when that happens, then there's only four threads pulling. Whereas the one on the right, all five people are pulling at 60% of their load. They can maintain that throughout the competition and they can win the race. So the idea is, is that if we can distribute the load over five threads more equally, 
we might have a better solution. So that's the first part of the solution, but there's a second part. Notice that if I was to draw a tangent point to this load, that the distribution, that the force distribution would look like this. And it comes off of this, it comes off of this thread up like this, right? It's very steep. Now, when I look at this one over here, notice that it goes out more to the side. It's not as it's not as steep. It's a more flat surface, a more flat slope. What that means is, is that the load is being transferred out away from the thread and into the body of the implant. The one on the left can more likely strip. The abutment screw inside your implant could strip easier with the design on the left, which is your traditional screw design. The one on the right will be harder to strip because the screw is sending its energy out radially away from the, from the abutment screw. So this is a really, really powerful thing. In fact, in my office, I have yet to have a single implant abutment screw loosen that was OEM, which was original equipment manufacturers. I have had abutment screws loosen that were uh, provided by custom abutment manufacturers, people that make custom abutments and did not use a, an OEM screw. And those I have seen loosen, but that's another story as to why you want to use OEM. But standard uh, spiral lock screws that are on the BioRisons implant, I haven't had one loosen yet. Here is an illustration of how it works. So on the left, you'll see the standard screw coming into play. And as it touches the inside of the, of the implant, it creates the, the colorful mushroom and the first one's carrying most of the load. On the spiral lock design, you get more of a radial load and more of a balanced load. So this is really important. Why? Well, let's say you put an implant in or someone else puts an implant in and it's not in the right location, which means now you have a, a, a prosthodontic solution that will create a cantilever. The cantilever will create a, 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 a bending moment on your implant. And there's nothing better to loosen a screw than a bending moment on an implant. Okay, that's, that's a surefire way to get an abutment screw to loosen is to have a prosthodontic solution that isn't centered over your implant. So now it's not centered over the implant. Would it be a good idea to have a thread that's designed, a screw that's designed to prevent screw loosening in a case like that? And the answer is, I think so, because once again, if we get the location right, we won't have this problem. If we don't get the location right, we're gonna fall back on using the best implant that we can use so that we can buy the best outcome we can for the patient. When we look at the platform itself, there's a couple things to take into consideration. There's an implant that came out and it has a platform that's all the same. And then you have that um, illustrated on the left and then you have uh, more of the traditional route where you have implants that have different sizes, like a 3.0, a 3.5 and a 4.5, for instance. And they're typically color coded like you see on the right. Now, who does the implant that has the common platform help? And the answer is it helps us. It helps the doctor. Why? Because then we don't have to have as many components in the drawer, right? It keeps our, our, it keeps our inventory lower and it's easier on us because it's all the same. But is it easier or is it have any advantage to the patient? And the answer is not likely. In fact, it may actually increase risk. And here's why. Notice that when we look at the implant on the left here, on the very far left, notice on this implant here versus this implant here, the thickness of the top of the implant's different. And so the implant on the left has a very thin wall and the implant on the right that I drew the arrow to has a very thick wall. So what breaks easier, a thin branch or a fat branch? The answer, a thin branch. A thin branch is easy to break. A piece of wood, a thin wood branch breaks easier than a thick wood branch. Same thing for titanium. Regardless of the material that we're making this out of, that material, if it was thin, like the one on the left, is more susceptible to breakage. The one on the right, less susceptible to breakage. So what we're doing is we're trading off our convenience as clinicians by having less inventory and saying, that's convenient for me, for a potential risk factor for the patients. If you've ever had an implant break inside someone's mouth after integration, it's not a fun story to talk. It's not, a, it's not something you want to have happen in your practice every day, right? So 
I would much rather prefer to have implant sizes where the platform changes and allows me to reduce the risk for the patient. So that's the take home point here. When we talk about implants, almost all of the modern implants have an internal conical fit now, and that has really been proven to be great. And the reason is, is that these internal conical fits create a self-centering feature. Uh, you can see this if you take um, two red solo cups and you drop one red solo cup on top of the other and you just hold the bottom one, the top one will center itself and fall into place, right? So if, if the bottom of your abutment is like one of the red solo cups and the implants, the other solo, red solo cup, when you bring them together, they self-center. And that's a good thing because when you're putting a, an implant in, you want it to go back into the centered position by itself every time so that your prosthodontic solution doesn't have any inaccuracies. These internal connections, these internal conical connections also create a decrease in lateral forces because of their design. They help to protect the abutment screw itself because of this decrease in lateral forces. And obviously they create a very good hermetic seal, okay? The next thing I wanna say is that when we look at implants themselves, it's important to understand that the implant is only one part of a larger system. And what I mean by that is that some implant systems out there, and what I mean by systems is like the, the system that you use to place the implant. So the drivers and the drills that come with it. Some implants are great implants and they might make all the grades that we talked about today. They might check all the boxes in all eight categories but the actual system itself is wanting. And what I mean by that is that they might not have, a, for instance, a fully guided solution. So a, a fully guided solution, a type four fully guided implant solution would be one where you can place the implant through the guide, okay? If you can't place the implant through the guide, then it's, and you, but you're using a, a guide to drill the holes, that's a type three, all right? So when you go to buy one of these things, you wanna ask not only is the implant good, but you also wanna verify that the system that they have that supports it is good. So you say, can I place my implant through the surgical guide? And if they say yes, that's a good thing. If they say no, that's not necessarily a good thing. And the reason is, is that it, even though the hole is drilled in the right place, when you go to place the implant, due to the difference between minor diameter and major diameter of the threads, you can still have some knockout where the implant gets knocked out of position and you end up with a result that's off. The location is off, okay? So it's important to look at the overall system, all the components that come with it, including, for instance, the prosthodontic solution. So if you were in a practice where you're doing a lot of overdentures, you wanna make sure that your implant solution works well with your locators and your OD secures and these kinds of connections that sit on top of your implant. So it's important to make sure that you look at the bigger picture when you're selecting an implant. In closing, at a high level, the very most important thing is getting the implant in the right location. So with everything that we talked about tonight, if you get a poorly designed implant made out of a poor material in the right location, you still have a, you still have a fighting chance of that implant lasting for a long time. If you get a, a, an implant off just a little bit from the idealized position, and you are using a strong implant with great you know, titanium that's used as a grade 23 medical grade alloy of titanium, and with a good implant design that decreases stress distribution to the bone with a reverse buttress thread, and has a really good seal around the neck so that bacteria can't get down and cause damage to around the neck, then you've got a really good fighting chance that you're not gonna have any complications. And at the end of the day, what this all comes down to is implant success. And we're talking about the four keys to implant success. The first one was location. The second one is what we place in the mouth. So implant design. Number three and number four, you're gonna to have to give Henry Shine good feedback and we'll come back and we'll deliver those messages shortly. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at this email that's presented on the, uh, the closing slide here. Thank you, Dr. Rob, for your time this evening. Great stuff as always. As a reminder, if anyone would like to watch part one of this webinar series, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we will send you the link of that recording. Additionally, everyone in attendance tonight will receive this recording via email. 
Thank you for joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thank you.